Hi, welcome back to my study for our final look at the letters of Paul to the Thessalonians. And today we are in Paul's second letter and it's chapter three. It's been really interesting looking at these letters together, hasn't it? And uh, we've got the final issues that Paul is dealing with today. But before he gets to those final issues, Paul has got a prayer request. I think just that as a thing in itself is really important to remember. Paul, the evangelist, the great missionary, the great apostle of God, asks for prayer. And you know, none of us should feel that we can't go to our brothers and sisters in the Lord and ask for prayer. We need it, whoever we are. I needed to ask for prayer yesterday and I was trying to uh, fill out the forms online to claim back some money from one of the grants we've been awarded for the project. So complicated, such a difficult website, almost threw my laptop through the window. I needed prayer. I asked a couple of people for prayer and uh, God has answered that prayer, at least in the way my mood feels about doing the whole thing. So we must always ask for prayer if we need it, whoever we are. So what does Paul ask for? Because that's quite instructive as well. Well, he says, verse one, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honoured. So actually, he doesn't start at his point of need like I did. Ah, I can't do this. Please help me. He starts with a desire for God to have his word spread in the world. And that's such an important prayer, isn't it? For us to remember to pray that God's word would go out there. You know, when we were in church before all of this lockdown happened, I used to go in on a Sunday morning uh, early before anybody else got there to pray. And one of the things that I would pray for would be that people here in Roos would hear the gospel and that that gospel would change their lives, that they'd get to know Jesus and be saved. And what an important prayer that is to keep on praying. Maybe every time before we come online, um, that's a prayer to be praying for each of us. That, that as God's word goes out there from this church, from all of the other churches around the world, that people would hear the good news and be saved. Let's not forget to pray that prayer. And he also prays that the message would be honoured. And I was reflecting on that and I was thinking about the way the attitude to God's word has changed over the centuries. And I was thinking, what difference would it make in our society if God's word was truly honoured? What difference would it make in our, our politics, in our social policy, if God's word was honoured? So there's a, a prayer to pray, isn't it? Lord, let your word be honoured by all and especially by those in authority in our society. How we need God's word to be honoured so that we can live in the right way to serve him and for the benefit of the whole community. So those are the first two prayers he prays. And then he asks verse two, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people for not everyone has faith. That's a very realistic prayer, isn't it? And it comes out of the situation that Paul finds himself in. It seems as you read through Acts, pretty much wherever Paul goes, there is trouble. There are people out to get him. Not so much because he's Paul, but because the message that he proclaims is not welcomed by everyone. It's a very realistic prayer. Not everyone has faith. It's the same today. And Paul knows that he needs prayer to keep going. Just because he's been through trouble time and time again doesn't make it any easier. And so he asks for prayer, prayer that they would be delivered at last from all of this trouble that he faces. But then you get the sense as he thinks about these people without faith, he remembers the key point, verse three, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. So his thoughts are back with those Thessalonians, aren't they? He knows that just as he faces trouble, they too are struggling 
under the weight of persecution. And they need to know, they need to be reminded that God is faithful and that he will strengthen and protect them. Even though it's the devil behind all of it, God is more powerful. God is sovereign and he will protect them. That's an important reminder for us, isn't it? Whatever we're going through, um, just because we're God's people, just because we know God loves us, doesn't mean that struggle doesn't happen. We've been seeing that, haven't we? In every kind of thing we've looked at in the Bible, it's always there, isn't it? Suffering. But God is there too, sovereign, in charge, loving us, encouraging us, strengthening us. And I think verse four is lovely. We have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we command. Because Paul has seen God at work in this Thessalonian church. The way they've already changed, the way they've already been showing so much love, the way they've been persevering through hardship and have become a flagship church is just a mark of God at work in them. And so Paul has confidence, not that the Thessalonians are great, particularly, um, but he has confidence in the Lord because it's the Lord who is doing it. So we need to have confidence in the Lord that he can do things through us, even though we might feel very weak at times. We have confidence in the Lord. And then he prays for them. So he's asked a prayer request. He's reminded them about God, he's encouraged them, and now he ends with a prayer for them. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. So even though they're doing really well, they can always know more of God's love. They can always show more of God's love. They always need his strength to keep on going. Past performance is... Um, is no certainty for future performance. We need God all of the time, don't we? We need God's Holy Spirit with us every minute of every day. And of course, he's promised that he will never leave us. So a prayer request and prayer given. And then Paul turns his attention to the final issue in the church. I've called this little bit a call for discipline. Now you'll remember that um, after Paul had had to leave Thessalonica and um, all of the, the trouble against Paul was happening, the rumours were going on, that they didn't love them, that he'd run away. And eventually he sent Timothy back to them to find out how they were doing, to assure them of his, his love and his prayers and to get news back. And you remember that the news that they got back uh, highlighted areas in the church's life. There's the issue of, of brotherly love. There's the issue of sexual immorality. And there was the issue of these people. The ones that I've called those with the ministry of waiting. Do you remember them? Um, they were the ones who were sitting around because, because the other issue was, was the issue of the Lord's return. When was he coming back? Had he already been? Um, what about the people who've died? And there was this group um, who seemed to feel that they didn't need to do anything at all, just wait for Jesus. But the problem with this just waiting for Jesus was that they were sponging off everybody else because while they were waiting for Jesus, they weren't working. And so the rest of the church family were having to support them. And this was an issue. It seems that this was an issue when Paul was there in person. If you uh, look down to verse 10, he says, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So it's basically the issue was there when he was there in person, that there was a group who didn't want to do their normal jobs of life, just wanted to wait for Jesus. And when Timothy came back with news from the church, it seems this issue was still there because in his first letter, Chapter 5, verse 14, Paul tells the, the Christian church to warn the people who are being idle. So it was still an issue. And here, in his second letter, it is still an issue. 
So this is a, a really ingrained problem with a small group of people in this church. And there were, there were two kind of um, problems with it. Um, one was that they were, they were sponging off everybody else, so other people were having to work harder in order to support them. And the other issue was that their idleness was leading to other things. Verse 11, we hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. And I just love that. They're not busy, they're busy bodies. Because they're, they're just waiting, obviously they're, they're, they're having to do something to fill up their time. And so they're, they're gossiping, they're basically being mischief in the community. And Paul says this has got to stop. This isn't a spiritual gift, a gift of waiting. We actually need to be awake and working hard. We see that theme all the way through, don't we? And so the church are called to discipline. And in verses 6 and 14, we see the form that this discipline is to take. He says, verse 6, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Then later down in verse 14, do not associate with them. So this is a this is a gentle discipline. They're not to be horrible. They're not to cast them out. They're not to slag them off. Obviously, they've already been warned. This has been the, the call all along. And, and now Paul's saying, well, just don't mix with them socially. Don't don't give them that credit. Stay away. And why? Well, we're told in verse 14, in order that they may feel ashamed. So he's wanting to nudge their consciences to make them realise the effect they are having on the whole community. They are not super spiritual. They are causing mischief. And church discipline should only ever be to bring about a positive change. And it is something that we're uncomfortable with, really. We don't do it very often. But Jesus commands it. If, uh, if you go into uh, Matthew's Gospel, Jesus talks quite clearly about church discipline, dealing with sin in the church. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. I'll let you look that up. Um, Jesus says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. They listen to you. You have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. Now, notice Paul hasn't got that far with this group. Because Paul says, don't treat them as a Christian brother or sister. But nevertheless, exercise this gentle discipline. And so it is there. And you notice with both of those, the, the words that Jesus says and the words that Paul says, do you notice who's exercising that discipline? It's the whole church family, isn't it? It's the people who are involved with it. He hasn't said, tell your leaders and then your leaders will issue an edict from on high. He says, no, this, this needs, um, initially, when Jesus is talking, a private approach, a quiet word. And then after that, a kind of a whole church approach. And that's what Paul is saying, isn't it? He's saying that as a, as a church family, this is how to deal with this issue. And I think that's, that's really encouraging, isn't it? It's about working together. It's about being on the same side. It's about working to promote God's good news, both within our church fellowship and in the wider community. We can't do that if we're setting people against one another. We can't do that if we're arguing. We can't do that if we're idling. We need to be together so that we can proclaim God's good news clearly. And to back up his words, Paul reminds them that he has taught them this. He reminds them of their teaching. That's at the end of verse 6. And then he reminds them of their example. Because here, Paul isn't expecting something of somebody else that he isn't going to do himself. 
And that's vital, isn't it? It's not one rule for one and one rule for everybody else. Everybody's in it together. And Paul says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, labouring and toiling. Why? So that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. So Paul could have gone to Thessalonica and he could have expected to have been given his room and his, his board, his meals, maybe even be paid for preaching. People made it a living of it. But he didn't want to that, even though he could have expected that, because he wanted to give them the example of, of hard work, working for God, working to support yourself and working to build up God's church together. Not being a burden, but carrying one another's burdens. And, uh, you know, we can commend Paul for doing that, can't we? That had to have been hard work, but it was the right thing to do in that circumstance. Now, how do we apply that? Well, that's the interesting one, isn't it? Because some people have taken this and said that um, we should have no welfare state because people should work and if they can't work, they shouldn't eat. Uh, people have also applied it to the church leadership and said, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't pay church leaders. They should all be um, working as well. We have to remember that this is for this specific situation, this particular issue that the church in Thessalonica was facing was facing this problem of these people with this ministry of waiting that needed to be tackled. There's plenty in God's word to remind us that we are to support the weak and the vulnerable. It's our duty to care for one another, to feed and to clothe those who are in need. And so we shouldn't use this as a stick to pe beat people over the head with. And Paul also says that a worker deserves his wages. So um, it's, it's not meant to be used as a, as a blanket that no leadership should be paid. But it is a reminder that we shouldn't be a burden to one another. And so that, that does promote a little bit of self-reflection, doesn't it? How can we make sure that under normal circumstances, when we're not struggling, when we're not ill, are we caring for one another by being responsible it, uh, it can be a, an issue sometimes so we've had a request for prayer we've had a call for discipline and then Paul finishes with a blessing and a reminder he says now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way the Lord be with all of you so he's praying for peace from the Lord of peace they're going to need that, aren't they, to sort out this situation in the church. They're going to need peace to be people who can persevere through persecution. We all need God's peace, don't we? We all need God to be with us, whatever we do, whatever we face. And he ends with verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Well, how we need God's grace day by day, moment by moment. What a wonderful way to end his letter. And did you just notice verse 17? I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand, which is the distinguishing mark in all my letters. This is how I write. Because you remember, they'd had, well, you might call it in modern day speech, spammy letters claiming to be from Paul, hadn't they? And they'd been taken in by them, by the false teachers. And as I was reading that, it was reminding me of... Um, I was listening to Mark Drakeford yesterday lunchtime as he was talking about the sort of the, the trace, the contact um, check-in that's going to be going on now uh, with the COVID-19. And he was saying very clearly, look, if people call you claiming to be contact checkers and ask for your bank details, then that is not genuine because we will not ask for that. And this is kind of what Paul is saying here, isn't it? Look, if a letter's from me, it'll have my writing on it. This is how I write. If it's not my writing, it's not from me. 
I think that's really important. How to check something is genuine and Paul has anticipated that. And so we have finished our study of Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. I hope you've enjoyed looking at them. I hope you've also enjoyed seeing how they link in with other parts of the Bible. That is the wonderful thing. Remember, the Bible is God's book. And as we read it, we will see how it all interlinks and interweaves as God teaches us, as God encourages us, as he equips us to serve him in the world. And tomorrow we're going to start something new. Now, um, obviously, it's all by God's grace. Um, but the, my, my plan is to go back in time to Genesis. Now, we're not going to start right at the very beginning. We're going to start at chapter 12 with the call of Abraham. And the whole book of Genesis is foundational to our understanding of how God works. It's behind all of the New Testament as well. And hopefully we'll see that as we study it together. We won't necessarily be taking a chapter a day this time. Um, I might take it in slightly smaller chunks, um, but we'll see as we go. So I look forward to doing that with you tomorrow um, as we start something a little different. But let's pray um, now for one another. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wise teaching and the wise example of Paul. We thank you for the reminder today that we should always ask for prayer, whoever we are, if we need God's help. And Lord, we know that we need your help all of the time. So help us not to be ashamed to ask for prayer when we need it. And help us to work hard in whatever you call us to do. Save us from delusions which say we don't have to do the things you've called us to do. Help us to, uh, when we have the strength and the ability to, to not be a burden and to carry other people's. And when we need our burdens carried, help us to be humble enough to submit to that. And we do pray that we would know your peace and your grace as we serve you today. Help us to remember we don't do anything in our own strength, but that we do it in yours if we want to honour you. And so as we pray for ourselves, we pray for our community and our world. Our loving Father, may your word go out to the people of Rus and around the world. Lord, help your message to, to spread rapidly through the internet, through word of mouth, through encouragement of others. Our oh Lord, send your word out and as you've promised, you won't bring it back empty. And also we pray for our, our leadership. We pray that your word would be honoured once again so that the laws and the rules and the decisions that are made are ones which are in accordance to how you have made society to work to its best. So we pray, come and help us. Come Lord Jesus, come Holy Spirit, come and help us today change and heal our world. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, amen. Uh, I hope to see you again tomorrow as we start on Genesis 12. Bye for now.